I think if we could just harness all this, we could probably build the most exciting company in the whole world. But anyway, thank you so much, and I'm honored to be here. And, and uh, of all of my endeavors uh, that I do in my life, uh, the most powerful has always been interacting with engaged and motivated young people. And nowhere have I found this power more concentrated than in the students I've met at gatherings of this organization. You know, yeah. So my involvement with Enactus actually goes back almost as long as the average age of the people in this room. Uh, so I guess you could say have a lot of experience. That reminds me of a quote. The error of youth is to believe that intelligence is a substitute for experience. Well, the error of age is to believe that experience is a substitute for intelligence. A highlight for me was serving as a judge of the 2005 Enactus World Cup had held in Toronto. Teams from 44 countries, ranging from the richest to the poorest around the globe, presented an amazing array of projects. The six finalists were in alphabetical order, France, Lesotho, Nigeria, the United States, Thailand, and Zimbabwe. Now, judging this diversity, as you can imagine, presented a huge challenge. Teams from the richer countries combined the innovative and sophisticated entrepreneurial achievements with stunning, stunningly choreographed presentations, while the teams from the poorer countries accomplished amazing things given the financial, social, and political challenges they had to overcome. Now, as I witnessed those six hugely contrasting final pre finalist presentations, it became clear that we judges must strike a balance between the projects themselves and the challenges faced in accomplishing them. Now, this guiding perspective that we adopted, or at least I had adopted, and at the same time, obviously, the rest of the judges were doing that as well, resulted in two finalists that couldn't have come from more contrasting backgrounds. America's Drury University and the University of Zimbabwe. The American presentation was, as you can imagine, extremely impressive, both from a business and social benefit perspective. The Zimbabwe project, on the other hand, while more modest in concept and scale, had to overcome huge challenges, including a rule by a despotic dictator, lack of fundamental human rights, pervasive corruption, even getting from one town to another required, re, re involved getting stopped by, at police roadblocks who demanded money for, quote, safe passage. So their project was aimed at providing an ethical and organized channel for marketing, marketing the handicrafts that country women made to supplement their meager incomes. An objective was, and that objective was made even more difficult by social bias against the, the empowerment of women in society. But despite all of the challenges, the team succeeded. For those impoverished women striving to support their children, the project was like a beam of light shining through darkness. I'll never forget the Zimbabwe team's overjoyed reaction when we pronounced them the winners. Their emotion flooded across the hall as everyone rose in a tumultuous ovation. All the teams, the winners, and the ones that didn't win joined in in the most enthusiastic, and it went on for, for a long time. And it was just, there wasn't a dry eye in the, in the place, as you can appreciate. So this proud, humble group of third world students exhibited the most important characteristics for success, humility, determination, resilience, and innovation. Their project was tiny on a global scale, but it serves as a perfect demonstration of the power of free enterprise and entrepreneurship to advance human progress. Now, human progress is driven by people who risk much of what they have to start a business or whom sacrifice years of researching a new invention or a medical breakthrough. 
Almost all the great te technological process, progress of the world is, has been, which has transformed the world, uh, has been either created or harnessed and made available by free enterprise initiatives. Besides providing products and creating jobs for people, businesses and their employees supply essentially all of the funds for government social programs. In fact, there is no historical record of any country sustaining a good quality of life for its citizens without a strong private entrepreneurial business sector. But you may ask, what after all is free enterprise? Some people refer to it as a capitalist system, and they call ideologies where governments donate, dominate production as a socialist system. But referring to them simply as alternative systems is like comparing democracy with totalitarianism. Social, socialism is an ideologically based system found in the belief that people aren't capable of making their own decisions about where and on what to work. So it's best if they were told what to do by government autocrats. Capitalism is neither a system nor an ideology. It's simply economic freedom. And that's why the term free enterprise describes it best. It's doing what has come naturally to human beings since recorded time. The first transactions when people traded a stone ax for a moccasin, leather moccasins, the natural forces of economic freedom has be, were unleashed. People are natural traders, always have been, and almost every ideological attempt to interfere with economic freedom is unnatural and proves to be destructive. Today, private business, of course, has advanced to a much more sophisticated level than trading and acts for moccasins, but only those countries that allow a high degree of economic freedom achieve good living standards for their citizens. But you know, there's another thing required to, for a good living standards for, for citizens, another kind of freedom. freedom. Economic freedom alone wouldn't lift countries like Zimbabwe out of abject poverty. Recently, my wife and I counted up over 70 countries that we had visited, some on business and others as tourists. As travelers, we're keenly interested in looking behind the facades to see what living in the country is really like. We found that only a precious few of those 70 countries, 70 some countries, offered a quality of life that lives anywhere near that we are privileged to enjoy in Canada. So besides economic freedom, the other prerequisite to a nation's quality of life is freedom from corruption. Freedom from corruption is an all too rare and precious freedom. On Transparency International's widely respected World Corruption Index, the top 10 countries are Denmark, Finland, Sweden, Norway, New Zealand, Singapore, Switzerland, the Netherlands, Australia, and what's next? Canada. Canada. The next, the next 10 include Germany, United Kingdom, Japan, and the United States. But after, that 20, after those 20 nations, freedom from corruption scores plummet fast. Out of the 175 countries assessed, more than two-thirds came in with dismal scores of less than 50 on a 100-point scale. Corruption's cancerous, corruption's cancerous tentacles strangle the hopes and dreams of people living in these countries. It teaches the young that corruption is natural and you must play the game. There, is, there are whole continents and subcontinents where corruption is so embedded that it's hard to see how it could ever be changed. And it's heartbreaking for all of us to see the desperate hopelessness and impoverishment that corruption rots in Africa and, and the Indian subcontinent, for example causing us, of course, as humans, to want to send money to help. But as Transparency International Chairman Peter Eichen has said, corruption is a major cause of poverty as well as a barrier to overcoming it. The two scourges feed off each other, locking their population in a cycle of misery, corruption, and corruption must be vigorously addressed if financial aid is to make a real difference in freeing people from poverty. So it took my life, most of my life, I should say, to learn these fundamental foundation stones that are needed to build a prosperous, fair, and caring society. I want to share them with you because it will be your generation that will keep our nation among the world's best places to live. 
and the qualities of the, and capabilities of the people in this room tell me that you'll play a particular, a particularly significant part in that. Okay, an act as competitors, so I'm laying a pretty heavy load on you, on your young shoulders, to do all of that for the future of our country and the world. And I doubt you signed up when you, uh, for that when you joined Enactus. But my passion for trying to make our country and our world a better place causes me to get a bit, a bit over carried away sometimes with explaining some of these things. And I hope you appreciate that. There's nothing that energizes me more than communicating with the young people, preparing to take that exhilarating leap into the waters that carry them to their career's destiny. Some find that leap, leap daunting, a little scary wishing they could just jump to some predictable dream destination. But being able to do that would doom us to a boringly predictable future, wouldn't it? Some people ask me what it's like to have fulfilled my dreams. But how could a farm kid who went to school in a little Alberta town ever have a, a, had, had, had any of those dreams? How could I have ever imagined that four decades later I would hand my successor the baton of a flagship Canadian company ranking at the top of its North American peer group, Canada's most profitable company and the most valuable, with a stock market value of $60 billion. And what was, and, and you know what I was most proud of? The company consistently ranked among, among the top three of Canada's most respected corporations all through that period. In, in the years that I was quarterback of the company, we did a lot of big number things. They add up to a lot. You know, we, we uh, invested a huge amount of money. We did a lot of mergers. And we did a lot of capital investments. And we added all those three together, and it amounted to about $100 billion worth of activity. That's a cool number, to rem but it was all beyond what this farm kid could even have imagined or dreamed about. We also executed what was then Canada's largest ever merger, and we grew exponentially, helping to build and strengthen the communities from British Columbia to Nova Scotia, as well as internationally. And our entrepreneurial enterprise contributed to our country by creating thousands of long-term, challenging, high-quality career opportunities. Career opportunities for employees who raise families and participate in building their own communities. We supported financially all kinds of community endeavors as a corporate citizen. We became Canada's largest energy company as we pursued our, pursued our mission proudly of energy, energy for people, creating value for shareholders, most of which weren't me, by the way. Uh, most of our company was primarily owned, as large, most large companies are, by pension plans and mutual funds private investor that support the small investors in, throughout the uh, Canada and the rest of the world. And of course, we paid billions in federal, provincial, and local taxes, and so did our employees. Now, this farm kid knew nothing about big business or the energy industry, and I couldn't possibly imagine any of this, as I said. But all I had was what all of you possess as well, potential. What what was the foundation of that potential for me? Well, it started with self-discipline that I learned on the farm. I have a simple way of describing self-discipline to people, deciding what you want to do, and then doing it. When I hear people say, I, I, I'll try to, I know they won't succeed. But when I, say, when I hear them say, I will, I believe that they will. The road to success also means paying the price needed, doing your best to whatever the assignment, having continuous curiosity and a positive attitude. Now, speaking of positive attitude, reminds me of a quote by a wonderful uh, Edmontonian, the late Bill Hunter, who said, it's not your aptitude, but rather your attitude which determines your altitude. It is all about attitude. Now, the most crucial thing my parents taught me was sound ethical values. Countries, countless studies have shown that a person's progress along the pathway of life isn't based solely on natural born gifts. Natural gifts are sort of the fuel for the engine that can propel us forward. But it's the values 
that we choose to live our lives by, which provide the moral compass controlling the steering wheel. Each of us can think of exceptionally talented people lacking a moral compass who veer off course. We can all name someone from the world of sports, entertainment, business, or politics who destroy their own lives, and along with that, the lives of the people around them. Communities which tolerate dishonesty and unfair play will produce workers and leaders who reflect those cultural values. And the opposite is also true. It's the collective values of Canadians which give Canada our strong ranking on that Transparency International Corruption Index and the fundamental reason why our country is one of the world's best places to live. Now what can we do and what can you do to preserve the values upon which our country is built? First, we, we need to remember the following that whether it's our family, our business, our community, or our country, we get the behavior that we tolerate. We get the behavior that we tolerate. And the other side of that is getting the behavior that we demonstrate. This is where every parent, every business person, every community leader, every politician, indeed every Canadian, has an important role to play. Several years ago, I read a book entitled Business as a Calling. A, career, a business career carries with it both a noble objective and important responsibilities. We must strive to build a successful enterprise, but we should show vision beyond the bottom line to the huge importance of building an ethical, productive, competitive, and accountable society. A society that provides opportunities for people to learn and build their careers through honest effort and a place where progress and rewards are based not on special privilege, but on the privilege, but on the principles of meritocracy. That's my definition of what it means to choose business as a calling and the life I've tried to live in doing it. So I've tried to do that in, 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 throughout my career and follow those principles in far from a perfect way, but uh, to leave as a legacy of my career. Today I want to leave you with a few of the leadership lessons I have learned as I pursued my career journey. First, create and communicate a noble mission for your enterprise. Remember the parable of the two men carrying the rocks up a steep hill who were asked, what are you doing? The first replied, can't you see I'm carrying those rocks to the top of the hill? The second man said, we are building a great cathedral. Set out your values and behavioral expectations for everyone to see. Put them all out there. Base everything you do upon those values and expectations and never waver from them. Strive to work with people you can trust and count on and avoid situations and people where you can't. Find people and work with people with strong potential and challenge each other, challenge each other to reach beyond where, all, where, where any one of you thought you could by working together. Entrepreneurial ventures always carry a risk of failure. There is no shame in failure. The real shame is not to heed the lessons that are learned. And finally, and I'm hearing this here, celebrate successes together with your team. And uh, what better place to hear that than here in Enactus. So, in conclusion, most of my life journey is completed. Just as I have been, you are fortunate to have the opportunity to pursue your life journey in a nation made up of people from all over the globe who share the privilege of economic freedom and the responsibility of living the values upon which our great country was built. Bon, bon voyage to you. We would now like to open the floor to questions. Please make your way to one of the standing microphones to ask your questions.
So you're allowed to ask questions as long as they're not too hard to answer. Thank you for a great speech, Gwen. Uh, my name is Daniel Kwakbenu. I'm the president of Anaxis State Polytechnic. <laughs> Anaxis has taught me to uh, take advantage of opportunities and be a risk taker. So today I'd like to ask you out for lunch, Gwen. <laughs> we'll talk about it. <laughs> Sounds good to me. <laughs> Thank you. As long as it's really a healthy lunch, I might come along, you know. <laughs> Others? Hi, my name is Stephanie Nieto, and I'm president of Anactus Ryerson. Over there. Um, I'd like to say that speech was really inspirational. And my question is, what's the hardest lesson you've had to learn over the past 20 years? How to make a speech. <laughs> uh, um, well, I guess it goes back more than 10 years, but I think the hardest lesson uh, has been that uh, despite whatever gifts and talents and abilities one might have as a leader, uh, it's not about you. You can, you can be the good leaders are the ones who uh, harness the talents of the people around them, where everyone feels like they're part of the team and they're all working together. And when that happens, when you get good people, quality people, motivated people who are determined to achieve, uh, being a leader is really easy. And during the first year, the few years of my career, I made it not so easy by not knowing that. It was a lesson I learned. Thank you. My name is Daniel Scott, and I'm with McEwen University. And uh, I, too, am very inspired by your speech, and I really appreciate you speaking today. Uh, one thing that really stuck out to me was when you talked about the quality of humility that you noticed in the Zimbabwe team. And I really appreciate that you said that first. So the question I have for you is, how does humility motivate you on a daily basis, in particular, how did the, uh, the experience with the Zimbabwe team uh, inspire you? Uh, well, you know, I, I guess I have, first of all, in terms of the, the, um, how it inspired me, the, uh, the, when people, whatever they are in their life, uh, there's various kinds of challenges, whether you're born with or uh, whatever the situation you're in, or in their case, the country they're in, um, are resilient and determined and, ri and somehow rise above what anyone has a right to expect. It's pretty inspirational. And these are the kind of people uh, that they, they, that team was. And quite frankly, I think that uh, their, the Enactics organization here and throughout the world uh, has those kinds of people that come together with those kinds of values and abilities. Um, so I think that, that the, the, but there is a, um, I don't know how to put this, but I think there's a lot of meism in the world, and we see it all the time. And quite frankly, I get frustrated by the, by the uh, people, young people celebrate, who are anything but human, they have anything but humility. And so the ones I, uh, people I really respect the most are the ones who have a lot of talent, accomplish great things, but have uh, a sense of humility about it. And uh, to me, that's the, the, that's, those, are, those are the really great people. Thank you. Hi, my name's Emily from Enactus St. Lawrence College. I just wanna say thank you from, I think, everybody at Enactus Canada for coming. It's been a fantastic speech. Uh, my question to you is, out of all of your endeavors, social and economic, what has been the most rewarding? <laughs> Judging it in actus. <laughs> uh, 
I truly never will forget that experience, and uh, and it's it's one of the reasons I've been so enthusiastic about this organization for so long. Um, I guess the, in terms of a, you know, sort of a business, straight business sense, it kind of goes like what I was talking about earlier, that that when you have when people have a sense of mission about what their organization is trying to achieve, when they have a sense of pride in that, when they think the values and the behaviors of, of the leaders reflect their values and what they want to have happen, and when uh, they can communicate openly uh, about anything that they don't want to communicate within an organization, um, you have just, the power of that is so so amazing to me that um, it's almost unstoppable. Thank you. Hi, uh, I'm Vineeth Kumar and I'm from uh, the University of Ottawa. I just want to say... So I just want to say that was an amazing speech, and it was great to hear you talk about your humble backgrounds for uh, a couple moments. And I just really wa was wondering, what was one important lesson that you gained from your farming days that you successfully applied into your business uh, life? Teamwork. Um, we were a family, mixed family farm, and everybody had to play their part. My sisters, uh, my, myself, my father, my mother, and that was our little enterprise. And so uh, there wasn't ever any question about, you know, am I going to do the chores in the morning or feed the cow or cow, cattle or clean out the pig barn or whatever? Um, we all did our part because we were all part of a team. And we were a little business, right, in a way. We, we were. Um, but that was something that I learned that, you know, the, that, that if everybody, everybody has to do their part, whatever that is, and then you count on each other. Awesome, thanks a lot. Hi, my name is Don Tran from Thompson Rivers University. And first of all, <laughs> first of all, just uh, want to thank you for sharing your story tonight. It was really uh, inspiring, I would say, for everybody, right? So um, my question is, what was and still is your number one motivator for you to get where you are right now? Well, I'm, you know, I'm, my, uh, I'm officially retired. Uh, so what do I do? My motivation, I, uh, first of all, every opportunity I have to talk or communicate with young people uh, is number one priority. And so I do this not with a group as distinguished as this, but I but I take those opportunities when I when I'm asked to. I always say that uh, you know for I don't talk to I get asked as you can appreciate to speak to all kinds of business groups and professional groups and so on across the country and elsewhere and and then I never do because to me, quite frankly, um, they're just too old to to change. And that's the reality, and so that's number one priority. I also uh, involved in thought leadership. I call it. I write a column for the Globe and Mail, and mine was actually in this morning. Uh, and uh, and on every all kinds of subjects, education and and various all business things, and and so on. But it's really, I guess, in my way. Uh, thought leadership, whether I'm right or wrong, or at least I, I provide it, and it has some influence. And uh, other than that, two-year-old grandson, four-year-old granddaughter, and a seven-year-old grandson living nearby, and of course, I'm mentoring them as well. I think I am. <laughs> Maybe that's the other way around. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, fantastic speech. We all really enjoyed it. Uh, I'm David from Anactus Medicine at College. And uh, 
We all know that uh, success isn't one event, it's a series of small victories. I was wondering if you could share with, I know, I know you're retired now, so it might be different, but um, when you're employed and at your, uh, in the most important position in your company, what were the things in your daily routine that were the most important thing that you did? Thinking. I, you know, that may sound strange, but I think you all can relate to this. The, the, most, of, most people spend their time doing, and it's even more so now in the, in the uh, cyber world where you know, people are glued to their, their computers or their iPhones or whatever it is. Um, and so they, they're working in real, t acting in real time, communicating in real time, you know, Facebook and all that stuff. And I used to say to my people that, uh, you know, if you think an hour a day, you can make us a lot of money, as opposed to just doing. You have to do stuff, right? But if you're, if you're thinking about it, if you're always reacting or doing or communicating, what, when do you put life into perspective? When do you think strategically? When do you reflect on things that you need to be reflecting on? How do you do that? And so for me, um, it was all about taking the time to really think. In my case, uh, I've been a fitness, uh, as some people call it, enthusiast or nut forever. And so my time was running and doing other stuff, but it was my thinking time. Whatever it is, take that time. Because it's a world now, especially where uh, it's always full of other stuff. But what are you learning? And what are you reflecting on that's going to help you? Thank you. My name is Drew. I'm from Okanagan College. And uh, with the triple bottom line being largely the focus of, of everybody in this room, as you were building your company, how did you manage to balance out the challenges of, of that, and was that as big of an issue? Well, you know, there were several different tiers of it. One of it is is just community support. I mean, you know, if you're active in a community, whether it would be in uh, Ecuador or, or in the Middle East or wherever we operated, and, and of course in Canada and the U.S., uh, we, every, everything is ultimately local, right? So your operations are local to those people in that area that you have, the, you, you have a particular operation in. So support of that community, uh, you know, and there's a, lots of, we, we did lots of stuff, you know, through sports and helping them build their arenas and, you know, things that meant something to them about their, their community and helped them build it. And so that was part of it. Um, the other thing was, of course, we, we, we had a straight philanthropic program that, that assessed all kinds of different thing we were, things we were asked to, to fund. Um, when it comes to sort of straight charitable, what you might call straight charitable donations, uh, not sort of community projects and stuff, my philosophy, and therefore the company's philosophy, was basically summed up in four words hand up rather than hand out. What we wanted to do all the time was to help people help themselves. And we looked for, we looked for projects and, and things we could support financially. And sometimes even not just financially, because we had our own people who were enthusiastic about these things. And that's the other thing. We, had a, we felt that where our employees were involved in philanthropic or community at work or whatever, that we, they deserved our support. So if they would put a dollar into funding something, we'd match it. We didn't ask any questions, as long as it was a, you know, an appropriate uh, you know, charitable donation. And so the combination of all that meant that uh, it was kind of funny because they kind of blended together. Sometimes the fact that our employers were working on something that we're passionate about. We became interested in it because it was more than just you know, matching, because it seemed like we should, we should look at it more deeply. So it was all a combination of things. But at the end of the day, uh, we were one of the founders of what's called the Imagine program. 
from Canada. And the Imagine program pledges 1% uh, of uh, income to uh, charitable donations and community support. So that was all part of how we went about it. It's, uh, it's, it's not simple, but it was, it was what we tried to do.